I'd like to thank the organizers for this invitation to attend this uh, very interesting meeting with a very wide range of interests being shown um, and wide range of questions. Um, I'm from the Raman Research Institute, and I'd like, which is in uh, the northern part of the city of Bangalore. And uh, for anyone who's around next week, I would like to welcome you to come and visit our very nice campus. It's a bit of an oasis in the city. So, um, um, <clears throat> I'll begin with uh, an outline of the talk. Um, I want to talk about first uh, discuss the question of what we mean by <coughs> observables in quantum cosmology. And for that, we need to first ask what do we mean by covariant observables in cosmology, and then what do we mean by observables in quantum cosmology? You can look at this, at this phrase here and parse it in different ways. And each of these is an open question. What do we mean by, by, by them? And so putting it together is going to be the aim of this talk. Um, and to illustrate the idea of covariant observables, I will talk about a particular model of um, uh, sequential growth dynamics placed in the context of an approach to quantum gravity called causal set theory, and in particular, this uh, causal set cosmology. Um, I will then discuss the quantum measure formulation of which Raphael gave a very nice introduction, and in particular, emphasize this history of Hilbert space formulation, and something that allows us to make a kind of prediction, a, a prediction, uh, based on the principle of preclusion and then illustrate how you can actually, um, actually uh, construct covariant observables in quantum cosmology, in causal set cosmology, in a particular dynamic, which is complex oscillation dynamics. We can construct covariant observables, and there are also examples that you can make of precluded events. So in particular, you have a way to um, talk about uh, observables in covariant observables, and make a prediction in this case. So let me begin with the twin horns, what I call the twin horns of quantum cosmology. And it's actually appropriate, when I wrote this down, I thought this is an appropriate thing to, uh, to talk about in Bangalore, because um, it, there is a bull temple, a famous bull temple in Bangalore. And if you haven't gone there, it's perhaps a worth, worthwhile visit. Um, um, so. What are the twin horns? I think we've heard uh, versions of it in Adrian's talk. The issue of covariance and the problem of time. We know that if we stick to a moment of time, if we try to look for a moment of time observables, special relativity al already has told us that those are not, not well, those are not covariant. Spatial distance is not covariant. Spatial area, spatial volume, none of these moment of time functions can do as observables. And so what we need to do is to, sorry, uh, is to go to space-time functions, things that require space-time descriptions, space-time functions like the space-time volume, um, proper time, the causal ordering between events. All of these somehow should be part of our construction of observables that have covariance in them. And an important thing to notice is that covariant observables, when you think about it, are teleological. Raphael mentioned black holes, cosmological horizons. These are the kinds of things that somehow require all of space-time to be, to be evolved, all of space-time, before you can describe them. And the natural way to address this question of covariance in the problem of time, I think, is the history's formulation. And that's the, that's the direction we need to adopt. And then you have the second horn, which is the dilemma of quantum cosmology. And, uh, I think J.S. Bell said it best, and I'll just highlight two of the sentences, namely that when the system is the whole world or the universe, where is the measure to be found? Uh, was the world wave function waiting to jump for thousands of millions of years to some highly qualified measure of perhaps in this PhD? This was very funny. And um, to address this question, this question of trying to have a quantum theory of closed systems, because we have nothing outside of the universe to measure or to collapse our wave functions. I will 
use the quantum measure formulation. So in other words, just to summarize, problem of time, we try to deal with it using a histories formulation, the measurement problem, we try to deal with it using the quantum measure formulation. So what are the kinds of things you might want to root around when you think about space-time? You try to think of what are the kinds of observables, what are the covariant observables we'd like to be able to talk about in quantum cosmology. Um, we have the sense that they require a fully evolved space-time, so it's somehow teleological. Um, but we, in fact, in principle, have access only to, in, in, in practice, sorry, have access only to finite regions of space-time. And I went back and uh, looked for what this word te teleological comes from, and in fact, Aristotle has this statement that an acorn's intrinsic telos is to become a fully grown oak tree. So if you keep this image in mind of an acorn, which has the potential to become a tree, and think in, um, in a statistical sense that we can be many kinds of oak trees, we're trying to look in this formulation for the covariant acorns of quantum cosmology. We'd like to look for things that will give us a handle on covariant observables and the search for covariant acorns, which will eventually become um, an oak tree. And all of this sounds very uh, crazy at the moment, but I think if you keep this analogy of a tree in mind in the rest of the talk, it'll become very clear what these covariant acorns one is looking for. You're looking for things that are finite regions of space-time, finite uh, things that we have access to, and we would like to use them to construct teleological observables. Um, so what are the candidate covariant observables in quantum cosmology? If I think of, um, for example, uh, I look in my bag of possibilities, I look out, pick up one, which is a universe that is going through several bounces, a cyclic universe. And in this case, I do have things that are well-defined covariant observables. If I allow this thing to proceed, progress to infinite time, then the number of epochs that, uh, I ha that the universe goes through is one covariant observable, right? And the space-time volume for each of these epochs is another uh, covariant observable. There's nothing non-covariant about this. So this is something that one might want to um, have as a candidate covariant observable. Other things that one might consider are past sets or future sets. And these things come up when you do Lorentzian geometry. These are very covariantly defined objects. These are just a set whose past is contained in that set, okay? or is that set itself. Right? So these are just past sets. They complete the past complete or future complete. And these are, again, candidates that you might want to root around in your bag and pick up as things to try to concretize. Another one is what I call the Hartle-Hawking um, initial condition. And this is rather, this is something that we'd like to be able to make a statement about what are the initial conditions of our universe, what is an initial condition that's compatible with the observable universe that we have. And a prescription given by Hartle and Hawking was by this wave function where you basically have a final, you have a, a spatial geometry, free geometry, and you write down a wave function for this by just looking at all possible geometries, four geometries, which have this as a boundary. And that's your Hartle-Hawking wave function. And the idea is that somehow if you did this, this is your initial condition of the universe, and you would then say, this would evolve and give you everything else. The rest of the universe would be decided based on this. But of course, if I think about that, unless I have some more teleological understanding of this initial condition, unless I think of the way for, uh, the universe as having com been complete in time, so I allow the universe to run on forever, I might have such situations happening, which is something that is another universe which joins up, which means that what I thought was an initial enough sufficient information for me to evolve the space-time. So something else could join in. So it's not obviously, this isn't good enough initial information. 
in fact, what I want is something which remains in this form throughout. So whatever initial data I have here, I can evolve it for all time, which means nothing else can join up, which means I want a teleological initialization. I want something that will tell me that I want to restrict to histories in which I have only this particular class of evidence. So there's something in this way of writing down an initial condition that I need to worry about whether it is in fact covariant. And for, in order to make it covariant, I need to look at the entire evolution of the space time. Okay, so all of this is all very well. It's rather vague at the, in, in, the way of, uh, you know, in the way I've presented it because we don't really know how to define these observables. We don't know how to define a quantum theory. So I'm going to go to a particular approach to quantum gravity called the causal set hypothesis. And most of you here, I'm sure, have not heard of this approach. So let me do a quick summary. And I apologize if it doesn't sound as explicit, explicit as it should. Um, we start with something called the causal structure coset, which is basically, if you take a space time, which is causal, and I just look at the causal relation between the events in that space-time, and I strip it of everything else. I just have the causal ordering between those events. That gives me a partially ordered set. Okay? And the partially ordered set has these properties that essentially there's an order relation between events. It is acyclic, it's irreflexive, and it's transitive. Okay? So X precedes Y, and Y precedes Z, then X precedes This is something that's there in every Lorenzian causal spacetime has a causal structure coset. What we do in causal set theory is to add in an extra ingredient, which is that of spacetime discreteness. We say that in any finite spacetime volume, we have only a finite number of events. Okay? So there's a fundamental discreteness. You've taken the continuum, of, you've replaced it by an atomic theory of space. Um, so that's the hypothesis that the underlying structure of space-time is a causal set or a locally finite coset, set. And this is an example of a 50-element two-dimensional uh, causal set which rep represents two-dimensional space-time. Okay, it looks like a, it's a graph, which is a directed graph. Um, it's motivated by um, some very deep theorems in Lorentzian geometry. Uh, one which is that if you just take the causal structure, this object before you put in the discreteness, that causal structure has a huge amount of information about the space-time. It has all the conformal information about the space-time geometry. The only missing ingredients, ingredient is the conformal factor, and that comes from this ansatz of discreteness. You put in discreteness to get out a conformal factor. Of course, all of this is in an approximate sense. And oops, um, what we do is we replace the causal structure with the partially ordered set and the space-time volume by a number. So in, a, in an approximate sense, this order plus number is supposed to reproduce for you space-time geometry. So what I've told you is just throw away your continuum space-time. Think of, think of space and time as this discrete structure, which is a partially ordered set. And we need to start to think of the questions that we were asking earlier in quantum cosmology, what are the observables, et cetera, within this framework of this discrete um, approach to quantizing gravity. So the first thing we need to do is, well, what is to write cosmology, how do we even describe cosmology? How do we describe anything like space-time with such a, uh, starting with something like this? And we have this very beautiful uh, model of sequential growth dynamics between David Rideout and Luke Sorkin. Uh, David is also with us today, so it's kind of nice that um, to talk about this. Uh, Classical sequential growth dynamics is basically a dynamics which is for cosmology. It's done within the classical meta theory context. And this, the generalization of this to the quantum context that I will talk about um, 
what is the initial condition? What do you do when you have a bunch of points? A bunch of events and you want to say, well, I want to create a quantum cosmology. What's the most natural initial condition that you can put on? You start with a single event. Okay? That's your starting initial condition. And then there was one. And you add the new element, one after the other. So the, the second element you can add, and you do it probabilistically, because we're just still talking about classical probabilities here. You add the new element either to the immediate future of the existing one or unrelated to it. And you can <coughs> grow this causal set element by element until you get a tree. And now you can see where the acorn analogy is going to come in and where the tree analogy is appropriate. You can construct from this the set of all possible causal sets. You can grow all possible causal sets which have the property that they're past finite. Elements. And depending on what probabilities you give, you can, you'll get different kinds of dynamics, different kinds of measures. So I've labeled all of this, I've colored all of this with different colors to say that the new element is, this is the new element at stage three, this is the new element at stage two, and so on. And so somehow all of this looks very labeled and very non-covariant, but we'll talk about how to deal with that in a minute. We'd like to evolve this until we get something back like space-time. Of course, that's the big challenge. And of course, we don't have the nowhere near such a but an example of this is, a very, a very simple example of this is transitive percolation, uh, where you give uh, the new element is added with a probability p, if it is to the immediate future of an existing element, to each such element that you add to, um, which is, for which it is to the future, you add, you uh, give a probability p, and if it is not related to an element at all, then the probability is Q. Now, if we go back here, important thing about this dynamics is that the new element is never added to the past. It's always added either to the future or unrelated. So there's a sense in which there's an, a growth and there's an arrow of time that, that's emergent from this process. Um, and this is within a larger class of dynamics which uh, satisfy the prin principles of general covariance or label independence, as well as a bell causality condition, which I'll say nothing about at all in this talk. And label invariance basically tells me that if I got the same causal set, as you can see, all three of these are really one and the same order theoretic object, right? With the same causal set, they just label differently because each of the elements came at different times. So we want to make sure that at least the dynamics <coughs> respects this label in invariance, which means that if I come up this way or if I come up this way, I have the same probability of doing both. Okay? Okay. That's the hope, yeah. Right, so you would have to phrase this within, this within the whole question of probability and so on. So in the classical case, we have some sense of when something occurs with high probability, you would expect that. But as we'll see in the quantum context, our probabilities are all negative in, in a very specific sense. So hopefully I'll come to that very shortly. So classical, in the classical uh, case, we have a very well-defined measure space we have a sample space, which is the space of all completed causal sets. You allow this process to run on to infinity, so you get countable causal sets, right? Countable um, teleological label causal sets. And the event algebra, Raphael talked about events, and they're really collections, subsets of histories. And when you write it in a careful way, in a mathematical way, then these constitute what is an event algebra. And these event algebras are, in fact, generated from what 
which are called cylinder sets, and these are sort of the acorns. In other words, if you start off with, uh, if you look at the steel two object of the, this, this particular causal set, it can be a whole range of other causal sets, but every one of them should contain a piece like this. So this is, in some sense, the kind of acorn that we're seeking. It's not yet covariant, but it's the acorn that we're seeking. So the measure space that we have is uh, this, where here mu is just a classical measure. And by standard theorems, you can extend this to infinite time. Because all of this is still, uh, this growth process is still happening only at finite time. You can only talk about the measure at finite time. And in order to talk about covariant events, we have to go to infinite time. They have to be teleological in a sense. So in order to do that, you need to extend this in a particular way. And that extension allows you to construct covariant events. So what are these covariant events that we can construct? We go back to those pictures we had from the continuum, and we ask, well, what is an analog of a bounce? Right? What is the analog of a bounce? It's actually very simple to, say, to, to phrase in this uh, language because all you need is a single element, this orange one here, I've singled it out, and such that which divides the causal set into its future and its past. Okay? These are what we call post events, and that's like a universe bouncing through, you know, and you can have several of these, and every one of them corresponds to a bouncing universe. Um, and you can ask, when does the first post, post happen? What is the probability, or what is the measure for the first post to happen at stage n? Okay. Then the stem events are analogs of past sets. And these are what are, I would call, the covariant versions of our acorns. They're past sets. They're just things that we can, I mean, we'll see an example of it very soon, but these are past sets which we can use to characterize events. We can say that what are the set of histories which contain this particular past set. Okay, so that's going to give you a whole range of histories, a whole set of histories, and that's characterized completely by this covariant, what I call a covariant acorn. Um, and you also have analogs of the hartle hawking event, but I won't, again, say very much about this. So let me just quickly go through um, a review of the quantum measure. Uh, we've seen that, uh, we've, seen, we've seen this particular sum rule appear in both in Urushi's talk, I guess only in Urushi's talk so far. Um, we really see quantum dynamics as a quantum measure space, which is a direct, indirect analogy with stochastic theory, with, with the classical measure space. We have our sample space of histories now of, of countable causal sets. We have our event algebra, and we have the measure. So both the sample space as well as the event algebra are exactly as in the cl classical stochastic theory. The only thing that changes is the measure, which is basically a non-additive measure and satisfies this quantum sum rule. The quantum sum rule is very, a very strange uh, mathematical quantity, this mu, and phrased like this. But there's a way to talk about it in a language familiar to mathematicians, or familiar at least to some mathematicians, which is to construct a Hilbert space, and you're constructing this Hilbert space via some, this GNS construction. You're using the space of histories to construct a Hilbert space. And although the construction seems very different from what you do in standard quantum mechanics, it turns out that in pretty much all the cases that this Hilbert space that you construct purely out of histories, purely by putting histories together and doing this GNS construction, is exactly the same as the canonical Hilbert space that you have in standard uh, quantum mechanics. But this is a Hilbert space that we will use, and we'll basically define the vector measure, something that takes values in this Hilbert space, and when you do that, you find that your vector measure is finitely additive. So you've gone from something that's non-additive to something that's additive, and in some sense, it's just rephrasing things we're already familiar with. We talk about 
amplitudes, adding them up, and so on. But this is more general than that. And it's, and it's in a product, basically, on two different events, as given by the d theorem function. So let me come to the sort of the important um, uh, conceptual point that I want to focus on here, which is the idea of preclusion. And it's, I call it the principle of preclusion. We're all looking for realistic, or several of us are looking for realistic interpretations of quantum theory. What exactly happens? What, um, what is going on when we don't do a measurement? Can we say anything about what's going on in quantum cosmology, as I've said? It's completely, it's very, very, uh, a very crucial question, what's going on, because there are no measuring devices. There's nobody outside measuring what's happening. So it's really important to understand what happens. Um, but the principle of preclusion tells us what is not going to happen. And in fact, this way of thinking about probabilities is a very, although it sounds kind of, it sounds perhaps complementary, it's in fact not complementary in the quantum context. And it's important to think of it as a founding principle for trying to, for, for any realistic interpretation, or at least the, the kind that we are uh, trying to seek. So when the measure of a particular event is zero, we say that doesn't happen. We can say that, we can predict that, we can say that doesn't happen with certainty. In other words, histories that have that event, in that event, which have that property, do not happen. Okay? So we will say that as our realistic interpretation. For example, if we found from some particular dynamics that the event that there is a post is zero, that means that posts don't happen. And that's completely definitive, that's completely realistic, a realist interpretation. The universe did not bounce. So we make predictions of events that do not happen, sets of measure zero. And if you want to try to do more, then there is a covent interpretation, which I will not say anything. This is sort of the basic principle from which we are now going to try to look at this quantum cosmology that we can construct and try to say something definite about it. It's far from anything realistic, but at least it's, a, in, in my view, it's a first step. So let's try to see how we can quantize this classical sequential growth model. And that is by doing something very simple. We take the transitive percolation which was a classical probability, and now we just make these amplitude complex, these, these probabilities into complex objects. So I take my P's and Q's and I um, make them complex, and although P plus Q is still equal to one, uh, when I take their absolute value, I get things that are, show me that it's not just a classical situation, and in this case, if I can do my history Hilbert space construction, the Hilbert space turns out to be very, very simple. Even though I'm talking about quantum cosmology, in this model is just a one-dimensional Hilbert space. Okay, so it's a really simple model to do calculations with. So it's, as people say often, this is sort of more a proof of principle calculation than something that we expect to be realistic. So we have a quantum measure space, and the idea is that we need to then extend this because the quantum measure space, these events are all built up out of finite time. If you remember, we had these acons, which were these labeled acons, they're all finite time events, and in order to get things that are fully uh, infinite time events, we need to extend this to uh, that infinite time algebra, okay, to get covariance. So the idea of the extension is something which, I'm sorry, I've been very bad with referencing here, but this is some ideas due to Rafael Sorkin, which is uh, this method of canonical approximants, which we can use to show that the measure which is defined on finite time events actually converges. We can check to see whether it's defined on the infinite time event, which is what you need to, to be able to say that the measure of the covariant event is well defined. I, I hope this is clear. We're, we're going from a finite time structure.
basically labeled the non-covariant, but in order to get covariance, you need to go to the infinite time event and then construct covariant observables from those infinite time events. Okay. So let's take a particular example. And the example of the observable that I want to calculate is that there is a single uh, element to the past of all other elements in, a, in this cosmology. Yeah? So it's just this one element here, which is to the past of everything, which means I can't go up this branch at all. Because in this case, this new element, this orange element, was not related to the blue element. So I want the blue element to be the past of every other element that you can ever go. So you're basically looking at one part of this tree. Okay? And that is completely covariantly defined. I have no ambiguity. There's no labeling, no issue with labeling, nothing. It's completely covariantly defined. So what I will do, in fact, is to look at the complement of this event, uh, and that is the stem event, which is whether there are, whether there's a past set which has just these two elements. So can you look at any causal set, could be anything you like, and you're looking at the set of all causal sets that has two elements like this. And as you can see, it's just the complement of the originary event. And so we're really looking to calculate this object, the measure of this object in this part. Uh, and it's completely, again, covariantly defined because I don't care how you label it. I don't care whether it's labeled blue and uh, red or blue and orange or orange and green. I don't care how you label it. I, that's a covariantly defined uh, object. Okay. Um, so I can go ahead and calculate this. And it turns out that it's, in fact, very nicely calculable. It, you can express it all in terms of this Euler function, which, and thus get an expression for the originary, the measure of the originary uh, event, uh, which converges whenever this value of Q is in the unit circle, lies in the unit circle on the complex plane. Okay, so this is a concrete statement. And then I'm going to ask now, can I make any predictions with this? but with the principle of protrusion in mind. Um, and I say, well, if I look at the Euler function itself, it's never equal to zero. So I can never preclude it except in this deterministic this limit, this particular case where it's um, deterministic evolution. Okay? So I can never say it doesn't happen for uh, most of the, the dynamics, all, all except one dynamic. But when Let's look at the, its complement. And you can find that if I, basically this is a figure that shows where, so in this figure, anytime there's an intersection between the blue lines and the orange lines is an example of um, a dynamics. Basically this is the values of Q within the unit circle. Any, any value of Q here, a value Q here, all correspond to dynamics in which the stem event doesn't occur. So in other words, in all, this all of these cases, you can say that this particular dynamic does not, this particular stem does not occur. This event does not occur. So we made a realistic prediction based on something that doesn't occur. Okay, so we can go make, make this more complicated. We can look at various post events and so on. And you find examples of the dynamics in which these things don't occur. And ultimately, we'd like to ask, uh, can we do more? Uh, we'd like to say we could ask the question, which we cannot calculate at the moment, but presumably can be done on the computer, which is to say, what is the, can we preclude, can we find dynamics in which having a post event at stage, for the first post occurs at stage uh, 100, say, 100 Planck units, basically, or whichever, particular scale that, that's your favorite scale, you're asking, does the universe bounce first at that point, at that time, at this sort of cosmological time? You can ask whether such things are zero, and 
in principle, at least, it's possible to begin to ask this question within these limited, very simple class of dynamics. So in, for example, you might want to ask how bouncing universes proceeded. And I claim that at least in principle, these are questions that we can answer just based on the idea of preclusion and in these very simple dynamics. So let me just uh, conclude. Um, I have lots of time left, but really rushed through a bit of it. Um, that it's possible to construct covariant observables in causal set quantum gravity. The originary event, these post events, first post by time k, the post event itself, um, things that I haven't talked about at all, which are the stem events and the Hart and Hawking events. And we find that some of these, in fact, evenly converge, which means that they're well defined, so you can actually write down the measure, write down the covariant measure of these in, these, in this particular model in complex populations. And just to make, the, make this uh, clear, these are predictions of the theory. They're consistent with covariance. And there's no recourse at all to external observers. We've made a statement about, I mean, it might not be a realistic model. So it's a realistic statement about the, about the system. So of course, the conclusions and open questions, I mean, the open questions are, you know, how do we generalize to a more generic dynamics? That's, of course, a very, very difficult question. But the hope is that by playing around with such toy models and being able to actually make covariant statements, make statements about covariant events and predictions about covariant events, that that's at least the first step in trying to answer more complicated questions. And another thing we might want to do is to start with these covariant events right away, to start with stem events, stem acorns, with which to describe your event. And uh, finally, again, I will say nothing about it, but there is this open question of how to incorporate Bell causality into the quantum, in the quantum context. So I have plenty of time for questions. I'll end here. Yes, we have time for lots of questions. So this is very interesting. Uh, my question is essentially about the bounds. So when we think about the bounds in the classical cosmology or other approaches to quantum cosmologies, we generally uh, think of the bounds. When we say the bounds of something, that, that bounds is of some scale factor or, or some volume. Here we are looking at a completely covariant picture, and we still don't have connection with the geometry. So I can understand that at a fundamental level, like the way you are thinking about the bounds as being just one event with some post and the pre branches. But why it is not possible that that one single event, uh, which you are interpreting as the point of bounds, may not be the same as what we actually think of bounds in terms of spatial geometries? Yeah, so I mean, you could think of generalizations of, um, so of course, when you just have one event. And that even has a very is large like, spatial volume. No, but that event is not, is the event is literally an event. It has no property. So this is the important thing in causal set theory, that you have events or you have these elements, and the elements are propertyless. The only properties you have are in the causal relation. So if you have just one element, you can't possibly construct space-time out of it, right? So does that also mean then that once we'll have this more complete picture, even then, we'll have very lot of difficulties with associating that bounce with some curvature scale. Um, so it depends. So, so here, the model that I've shown you is a very simple model of bounce, right? I could definitely think of perhaps more realistic, more more complicated models of bounce, where instead of a single element there, I would, and these are things I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, but this is more like the idea of the full stem, where you want to divide. So you say, well, here's my bounds, and I've got something here. And, I've, you know, and this thing I would like, at the scales that you're interested in, perhaps I want to 
associate some kind of a continuum structure to it. Then I'd have to have this region, this sort of sub part of the causal set, to be much larger, to be large enough for a continuum approximation to be valid. And you could, in principle, I mean, we haven't been able to calculate things with such complicated things, but you could, in principle, then associate to that some physical property. properties. You could, I mean, in a given model, you could, in principle, calculate whether this is going to happen or not. Mm -hmm. So if I understand correctly, like I mean, the bounds may not be just, happen, sorry. that the bounds may not be just single event, but it may be just a, a minima of the events. Yeah, something evolution. that just separates, separates two regions into mm -hmm. past and future. The post is the simplest one, and in some ways, it's eas much, much easier, and sort of one struggle with these full stem kind of events, because even to define, to, to be able to calculate anything, even in the simple model, is fairly non-trivial. So. Uh, so, is the definition of events being related? So, is that I mean the related? The definition of related is it that uh, is 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 it that they are in in the partially ordered set? So, so is that the definition of being related? Yes, it's an order theoretic uh, relation. So, in, in in other words, so so I rushed through this maybe faster than I needed to, but essentially, if you if you think of the space time and you think I mean, so let's just start with continuum. And to give you an intuition of what we're talking about, start with a continuum, start with Minkowski spacetime. And like I said, you just take all the events in Minkowski space -time. In other words, all the points, and just the order relation, causal ordering between those points, and you throw away everything else. What you get is a partially ordered set corresponding to Minkowski spacetime corresponding to the causal structure of Minkowski space time. So that's all we want to do. We just want to have a partially ordered set. We're now throwing away where we got this idea from. We're saying that these are the objects that we need to be able to, need to deal with. And you have points, you have events, and you have relations between events. And in the continuum approximation, you would, you would uh, interpret these order relations as causal relations. But as such, they're just some order theoretic relations. Okay. And the, uh, can the probability corresponding to P be interpreted like a, as a time-like separated event? And the probability that corresponds to Q interpreted as a space-like separated event? Because... Yes, it is sort of... It is because you're throwing away some events and... Yes. I mean, in this particular case, that's absolutely right. So you're actually saying that you're, you're making a statement. So for example, if you had a, you sort of were in some end stage of your growth and you're adding in a new element, you can add it to the immediate future of some set here and not related to any of these elements here, for example, yeah? So for all of these elements, you'd, in this growth transitive population model, for all of these elements here, you'd have a probability Q for each of them. And for all the ones that, for which it is to its immediate future, you have P. So if there are M of these and N of these, then it would be P to the M into the N. That would be the problem. Okay. And another thing, so I don't know whether I missed something, but so... Lots of time for questions. So but yeah, so, so, so we first define all these events, right? Uh, defined by the different probabilities P and Q. And uh, then we, and then we construct, then we construct a measure uh, then we construct that, uh, so the probability of throwing away some of these events. So we definitively say that the probability of this happening is zero. So doesn't it seem a bit circular? I mean, we are defining the events first. And then we are saying that some of these don't happen. We definitively say that some of these happen with a probability zero, meaning some of these don't happen. So, so doesn't that seem a bit circular? Uh, so let me just say that you can define events and everything based on just these two objects here. This is what I'll call the kinematic structure. And all of the events are described here. 
when you put a dynamics on it, you're putting in a measure, and that choice of measure gives you whether something has, that choice of measure is what will tell you whether something, some event happens or doesn't happen. We're looking at a dynamics where, which is the simplest one we could construct, which is a quantum one. And in that dynamics, we're asking whether the measure of certain covariant events, because that dynamics, I want to stress, when you define it, it's defined on things that are labeled. They're not intrinsically covariant. So non-covariant dynamics, because it all depends on which labels. You just make sure that the outcome of any, like I was showing you, two different ways to get the same thing, that it, the dynamics obey some label invariance, obeys label invariance, but nevertheless, the events themselves, finite time events, are not themselves label invariant. The labeled objects. So that is what you're starting off with, and you're asking, well, what do the unlabeled guys look like? Uh, I just wanted to comment in response to Parampit's uh, question, which I think you were asking, what's the relation between this definition of a post? And the idea that a bounce is something where the spatial volume goes to zero. Was that? A minimum, not to a zero. Uh, well, OK. That's a more, I see, that's a, is that, was that the issue? That it? It's not a so you, well, that, I see, that would be a more general thing. But the, the first question you could ask is, is this an example? In this case, the minimum would be essentially one Planck value, if you like. So maybe you weren't raising this point, but tell me, but let me answer it anyway. So the question was, can this definition that Sumati gave be interpreted as the spatial volume going, let's say, in this case, to one Planck volume? And I just wanted to say that it can. Maybe that wasn't clear. Maybe it was clear to you all along, but I wanted to say that it can but it's actually a more satisfactory version of that because when you ask what the spatial volume is, that depends on how you slice the space-time. Right? In this case, the definition of the post is completely independent about any convention about dividing the causal set into uh, layers or slices, surfaces of constant time. However, there is a notion of some discrete analog of a slice, which is in causal set language is a maximal anti-chain. In other words, a set of elements all unrelated to each other, but such that no other element can be added to them without int introducing a relation among them. So it's a maximal anti-chain. So what one could say in that particular example is that every maximal anti-chain, in other words, no matter how you slice the causal set, there, if it contains that post event, then it is nothing but the post event. So all ways of slicing will lead to a spatial volume of one Planck unit uh, at that time of the post. Then you could try and generalize. You asked a more general thing about minimum, and I think Humity basically answered that. It would, it would be a more complicated event to define. Uh, but the simplest, as she said, the the, the neatest, cleanest, and simplest kind of bounds to deal with is a complete big crunch followed by a, you know, by an expansion. It is in this session, and uh, let's thank Professor Sumati Surya once again. <laughs>